and welcome back. We're going to pick up our discussion with nutritional medicine and concussion management. And I think you're going to be very impressed, actually amazed to see that the, the major disruption that occurs in brain cells due to concussion and mild traumatic brain injury, that the damage that occurs on a, on a uh, uh, cellular level, that the most uh, effective way to repair that damage is through the use of nutritional medicine, which is highly ignored through traditional channels of concussion treatment. So this is where you can play a very big role in, ru in running concussion programs that would be highly meaningful to many patients and athletes. So we'll get started. So of course, when there's concussion, one of two things can happen. There can be a, an, a direct blow to the head, or there can be rapid deceleration of the head. And in both cases, the brain is sort of floating in a fluid medium within the skull, and the, the, uh, the brain basically starts colliding with the skull bones. And uh, with that, you get bruising, and you get um, torn tissue and swelling. And then, of course, uh, you know, the symptoms that the patient starts to feel are headache, dizziness, confusion, nausea, they have sometimes difficulty hearing or seeing, they might have double vision, and lack of concentration. So let's think about this. Headache, dizziness, confusion, nausea, difficulty hearing, some visual changes sometimes, lack of concentration, of course some memory loss. Then there's the risk of the second impact syndrome, where before the, the uh, first concussion injury completely heals, there's a second impact, which often occurs in athletes who return to competition too soon. And when that happens, you can get massive swelling, and that swelling can cut off blood supply to the brain very quickly, and that can actually be fatal right there and then. But it's certainly a uh, second impact syndrome leads to a greater degree to permanent brain damage uh, on many levels. So making sure the athlete's completely well before they return to competition is a critical factor in concussion management, as you know. So you're going to be seeing um, me citing a lot of uh, studies here with respect to nutritional medicine in the uh, management of concussion. And I thought I would show you up front the, the major references where this came from, because you'll see these references sort of interspersed here as we go along. But these are outstanding journal articles and textbook reading that uh, you should look at at some point uh, in your career if you have time. But I'm going to give you a summary of what there is to know right now. So in a concussion or mild traumatic brain injury, you know, it results from either trauma and or deceleration of the brain that's very fast, where the skull um, imparts shearing and torsional forces to neural tissue followed by metabolic and mechanical changes. And we'll look at those metabolic and mechanical changes. Remember that whiplash, even if the person doesn't hit their head, can still produce uh, potential concussion damage just from the quick deceleration and, and the brain sort of sliding in the fluid medium within the skull and slamming into the skull bones. So here's an overview of the pathophysiology and concussion. Uh, one of the things that's really significant is diffuse axonal injury. So the axons of the, of the brain cells become damaged, and this is often visible on MRI. And sometimes the, it's very visible if the, if the nerve cell dies. But the diffuse axonal injury is considered instrumental in causing some of the cognitive sequelae, such as memory difficulties and concentration abilities, we think are largely due to damage to the nerve axons, and we'll look at what that damage looks like. There's also this uh, immediate initial depolarization of the neuronal membrane. So the nerve cell membrane depolarizes, and with that it releases a lot of excitatory amino acids, particularly L-glutamate. Now, a lot of L-glutamate uh, release can be very toxic and damage nerve cells, and so this is a very scary proposition when you have a massive release of glutamate from the depolarization of the nerve cell membrane. And it also then, the, it produces a flux of calcium. So calcium comes rushing into the cell, and potassium is now leaking out of the cell. 
and magnesium is leaking out of the cell as well, which is creating uh, difficulties because you need magnesium to generate energy. And as you lose magnesium, more calcium tends to enter the cell. And with, with calcium entering cells, you'd start to decrease uh, blood flow to the, to the brain tissues. And you also have uh, to try to pump the calcium back out and to pump the sodium out and bring the potassium and the magnesium back in. You start. You have to upregulate all the different pumps that pump these these ions across the the, uh, the membrane. So there's hypermetabolic glycolytic activity. So that the nerve cell starts to burn glucose very quickly, using glycolysis. And with that, you start to get increased oxidative stress, as you're going to see. So remember that L-glutamate is a very excitatory neurotransmitter, and its sister compound, gamma-aminobutyric gamma acid, is inhibitory. So this massive release of L-glutamate is very toxic to nerve cells. Now normally, as we have seen in other courses, the astrocytes play a very major role in L-glutamate storage and recycling of L-glutamate in the brain. We'll look at that in a moment. And the increased hyperglycolytic state as the brain cell starts to burn glucose very rapidly uh, to repair the uh, nerve uh, membrane disruption. Uh, it's producing free radicals, there's more uh, inflammation. And the mitochondria are also damaged. And so the mitochondria cannot generate ATP energy nearly as well using oxidative phosphorylation. And so the nerve cell has to rely more heavily on hyperglycolysis and it's a very inefficient way to, to actually generate energy. And so there's all kinds of trouble brewing. And then if we look at some of the um, damage along the axon, you get this sort of damage to the microtubules along the nerve cell axon. So it disrupts both antrograde flow of peptides and retrograde flow of peptides. And these peptides that are moving from the cell body down uh, you know, towards the end plates uh, are carrying very important information for nerve growth and to maintain uh, structure and function of the nerve cell. So if you completely disrupt the flow, as can occur with diffuse uh, damage, then sometimes the nerve cell will actually die and, and that will be it. But if the nerve cell doesn't die, the microglia get involved in trying to repair the damage. And we think that niacin in the form of uh, nicotinamide might actually help to repair that damage by supporting the tau proteins, as we saw in our discussion of Alzheimer's disease. So if you look at the axonal injury, here's a normal nerve cell. Here you have shearing and, and damage to the axon, and here you actually have uh, the, dam the damage is permanent, and you end up with uh, nerve cell death. So with respect to glutamate, uh, glutamate normally is removed from the synaptic cleft by astrocytes to prevent toxic buildup and neuronal death. So uh, when you have glutamate in the synaptic cleft, we're looking at what is what's called a tripartite synapse. In other words, you have the presynaptic nerve cell, the postsynaptic nerve cell. And then you have the astrocyte, which has its own little end plate sitting there, foot plate sitting there. And the astrocyte actually removes the glutamate from the synaptic cleft because if too much of it builds up, it becomes toxic to the nerve cell. So this is normally what happens. So the astrocyte then can recycle that uh, glutamate and convert it into glutamine. And you're saying, how is it doing that? Well, remember that the aromatic amino acids that are entering the brain like phenylalanine and tyrosine and tryptophan, they're being deaminated as they get converted into neurotransmitters. And the amide group can be stuck onto glut glut glutamic acid or glutamate to form glutamine. And the glutamine can enter the bloodstream, travel to the liver. The amide group can be taken off and converted into urea, which is a, a, a way the body can eliminate ammonia safely or some of that glutamine can be recycled back to the original nerve cell, and as required, it can be converted to glutamate and released into the synaptic cleft again. So the astrocyte is sort of this uh, trafficking controller of glutamate and its recycling, and some of that glutamate can be used to form glutathione in the brain, because you need glutamic acid and glycine and cysteine to make uh, that very important antioxidant and uh, detoxification agent known as glutathione. So the astrocytes playing this very important role in cycling this. In a concussion injury, you're getting massive release of glutamate, which is causing damage. What you want to try to do is help the, the astrocyte 
clear up that damage before it becomes too significant. There are nutrients that can help do that. And then you have, as I said, vasoconstriction. So this uh, influx of calcium across membranes uh, throughout the brain where the damage is will cause vasoconstriction. You'll reduce blood flow to the brain and also with that you'll decrease glucose delivery. So you get over time, not immediately, over a few days you get resultant metabolic depression. The brain energy demand is not being met adequately and this lasts for a number of days. And you want to try to reverse that if you can using certain nutrients. And so this, of course, all renders the nerve tissue more susceptible to further injury. So sort of this broad strokes view again, you have initial disruption of the neural filaments and the microtubules that provide a framework for axonal transport. This compromises anterograde and retrograde transport of molecular proteins to and from the cell body. So we saw that. You also get proteolysis. So whenever there's damage to cells, some of the proteins actually get broken down. Some of these proteins are enzymes, some of these are structural proteins that support the microtubules. Um, so you, you, know, you have protein damage which then is going to interfere with normal function. And you have the, neur the neural membrane disruption and inflammation occurring as arachidonic acid gets sort of released from the nerve cell membrane, it forms prostaglandin series 2 mediated inflammatory chemicals. You want to try to suppress that. And the, the ionic shifts and the increase in intracellular glutamate and calcium uh, causes uh, toxicity due to glutamate and, of course, vasoconstriction. If there's severe damage to the nerve cell um, and it can't be repaired, then it can lead to caspase-mediated apoptosis. That means the nerve cell will actually undergo programmed cell death. And of course, the inflammatory cascades also contribute to um, further brain cell dysfunction. But let's look at caspase-mediated programmed cell death. So when there is significant uh, damage to cells, sometimes these caspase enzymes, here's caspase-9 and caspase-8, um, and there's other ones that can actually induce apoptosis, and they typically do it by uh, removing cytochrome C from the mitochondria. And when you do that, the mitochondria can't generate energy very well. It undergoes fragmentation, and then the whole mitochondria shuts down. Now the cell can't produce energy, and so it dies. And of course, the two major glucose and metabolism alterations include hyperglycolysis, uh, because the nerve, because the mitochondria are not working that well, and um, you need you need ATP energy to start repairing the damage that's occurred, and so this has to occur uh, using uh, hyperglycolysis as the main ATP energy source, or as a, as a greater source of ATP energy. With that, you get oxidative dysfunction and more free radicals being generated, which contribute to further damage to the nerve cell. And you have mitochondrial injury as a result of concussion and mild traumatic brain injury. With that, you're going to decrease ATP synthesis. And a lot of the, some of the electrons are going to leak out of the mitochondrial membrane into the cytosol, going to interact with oxygen to form reactive oxygen species. And now you really crank up oxidative stress. So you're having more oxidative stress and decrease ATP energy production which you, you need in order to repair all the damage and you're having less. This is one of the areas where creatine monohydrate supplementation can be extremely beneficial to provide the nerve cell with a backup source of energy to start uh, generating ATP so it can start repairing the damaged membranes and, and suppress some of the, um, the secondary damage that's occurring and give it the energy to reestablish the normal electrical potential across the membrane and energy for membrane uh, repair itself. Creatine monohydrate, a very important player, we think, in um, concussion management. And of course, the cerebral uh, blood flow that's constricted uh, with uh, less blood and uh, glucose availability over time, as we've mentioned. So this little chart sort of summarizes things. It might be a little bit hard for you to read. So here you see um, the, uh, the nerve cell body and the axon. And so what you see is um, upon immediate impact or immediate injury to the brain, you get this massive release of glutamate into the synaptic cleft, which can be very toxic. The second thing you see is a depolarization of the nerve cell membrane, and that allows a rapid uh, uh, influx of calcium into, into cells and an efflux of potassium. 
and also an influx of sodium and an efflux you're not seeing here of magnesium and uh, that magnesium loss hinders uh, ATP production both in glycolysis and in uh, oxidative phosphorylation in the mitochondria and then you have um, this rapid uptake of glucose initially until vasoconstriction kicks in with hyperglycolysis to try to generate ATP energy to stabilize these nerve cell membranes and with that you start to get an increased amount of oxidative stress and you have increased oxidative stress being generated around the mitochondria from uh, hydrogen electrons leaking out of the membrane into the cytosol interacting with oxygen to form superoxide anion and then uh, hydrogen peroxide and hydroxy radicals and some of those uh, free radicals can actually damage the nucleus of the cell damaging uh, the uh, nerve cell DNA. You also get uh, restricted blood flow over time that starts to occur after um, 30 minutes or so and um, as well you have the, um, the damage to the axons here but the damage to the microtubules and hopefully that can be repaired uh, nicotinamide may help with that, creatine may help with that if the nerve cell hasn't uh, undergone apoptosis because the damage was uh, irreparable. So the goals of supplementation in concussion and mild traumatic brain injury and in post-concussion syndrome is sort of multifaceted. There's a lot of things that nutritional medicine can do to help repair and reverse the damage that we just saw. So certain nutrients can help to decrease inflammation. Other ones can help to increase ATP energy and reverse mitochondrial dysfunction, which is critical. Other nutrients are required. There's no option. They're required to repair the plasma membrane so it stops leaking and allows the normal synthesis of the phospholipids to make up the plasma membrane, like phosphatidylcholine, and then from once you have phosphatidylcholine, you can also make acetylcholine, which is a memory chemical to help with uh, memory uh, restoration. You also want to increase and support other uh, neurotransmitters, not only acetylcholine, but also dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, so you get a, the proper balance of neurotransmitters. And you need to get some antioxidants in there to mop up the the free radical damage that's going on and decrease uh, the damage from L-glutamate, and we think. Cooperzine A has shown tremendous promise here, as has creatine. And you want to improve cerebral blood flow so you get more oxygen and glucose flowing to the nerve cell. You don't want that to be constricted for uh, any lengthy period. And you want to try to, if you can, stabilize and repair the microtubules so the, the axonal transport of key peptides can uh, resume in normal fu fashion and, and help to reverse uh, some of the uh, important symptoms associated with diffuse axonal injury. So we'll look at these, uh, each of these in some detail, but this is sort of a high-level overview of how, you, how nutritional medicine factors into this. So I thought I'd get you excited about it before I showed you the details. But to reduce inflammation, the way that you, that gets done is with omega-3 fats uh, because they produce anti-inflammatory prostaglandin series 3. And there's some uh, experimental evidence to show the value of curcumin as well decreasing prostaglandin series 2 and also other inflammatory cytokines and uh, nuclear factor kappa beta which is a key uh, um, transcription factor that upregulates the release of many inflammatory uh, cytokines by these cells. To increase ATP synthesis and reverse mitochondrial dysfunction the evidence is very strong to support the use of creatine monohydrate, coenzyme Q10 and alpha lipoic acid. This is really how you, you make that happen. There are no drugs that can do this. Uh, repairing the nerve cell membrane, uh, phospholipids, there are no drugs that can do this. You need choline, and you need choline especially, as you'll see, in the form of CDP choline, and then also, also phosphatidylserine, uh, and then additional DHA is helpful, and you need folic acid and B12 because you're going to need to form SAMe so you can con con convert uh, phosphatidylethanolamine into phosphatidylcholine as we've seen in other courses. A very important uh, brain phospholipid is phosphatidylcholine. You need to make that and you need to make it quickly to repair that brain uh, membrane damage which is causing all the leaking to occur. 
and you want to increase brain uh, neurotransmitters. So how do you do that? Well, CDP-choline can increase acetylcholine and dopamine and serotonin and norepinephrine to some degree. And I like supporting CDP-choline with additional choline, as we've talked about before. And um, other nutrients can help to also uh, support um, uh, acetylcholine concentrations like phosphatidylserine, bacopamonieri, huperzine A. We talked about this in the Alzheimer's program. And vitamin D as well, which upregulates the, the genes for synthesis of some of these uh, neurotransmitters. You want to make sure that vitamin D blood levels are in the ideal range. And in terms of suppressing oxidative uh, reactive oxygen species and free radical damage and, and damage from L-glutamate, studies show that vitamin E and vitamin C can be helpful. Bacopamonieri, a very important brain antioxidant. And creatine, uh, showing promise um, in, in Huntington's disease in, in decreasing damage from L-glutamate and also acting as a, as a brain antioxidant. And huperzine A, not only supporting acetylcholine levels, but also prevents damage from L-glutamate, according to published data. And to improve cerebral blood flow, we see we're back to omega-3 fats. And to stabilize um, microtubules, uh, the consideration of uh, nicotinamide, as we saw in the Alzheimer's studies. So if we just go back, you'll see that many of these nutrients are multimodal. We see omega-3 fats doing a number of different things. We see creatine mon monohydrate doing a number of different things. CDP choline does a number of different things. You know, so some of these repeat in the different sections, bacopamonieri repeating from one section to the next because they're multimodal. So when you start to um, condense this down into a protocol, you see that it's, it's not overwhelming actually for the, for the patient to adhere to. And if you explain to them what these things do, then you're, you'll probably get pretty good compliance. So I, before we look at some of the oral nutrients, I wanted to bring to your attention this multimodal effects of magnesium, studies that have used a, a magnesium IV. This is something that's uh, relatively new. So we know that intracellular magnesium levels get depleted uh, right after a, tra a traumatic brain injury, and they remain low for four days, so a lot of magnesium leaks out. When, when we have that magnesium leaking out, you start to get neurological deficits. And studies have shown that sort of pretreatment with magnesium in experimental studies with animals uh, helps to minimize the amount of, of nerve cell injury after uh, trauma to the head. So the magnesium is required uh, in multiple mechanisms in the nerve cell. It's required for energy production in both glycolysis and in the mitochondria for oxidative phosphorylation. So when magnesium levels are low, it's even harder for the cell to make ATP energy. And magnesium is also necessary for maintaining cellular membrane potential and in initiating protein synthesis. And those low levels unblock certain receptors that allow more calcium to leak into the cell which causes deleterious effects, as we talked about vasoconstriction and other effects. If you have too much calcium in the cell, it's not helpful. So these uh, researchers went on to create a, an IV cocktail that they call Pro-IV that they've been using in um, concussion injuries, which contains uh, magnesium and zinc. There's also a, a significant loss of zinc in the urine after concussion. And so the pro-IV treatment is, is, an, is essentially a cocktail of substances that aim to rebalance those micronutrients, magnesium and zinc. It also contains some anti-inflammatories and a non-opioid pain and non-opioid pain relievers mixed in to treat immediate symptoms. Um, all of these individual ingredients are approved by the FDA. So the, the, some doctors are starting to use this in the first few days or the first week or so after a concussion, which I don't think is a problem. But this is not the whole story. Certain oral supplementation of key things in nutritional medicine should also be added to this. This, in, its, in and of itself, is not uh, an adequate treatment. So let's look at how we achieve some of these goals in concussion management. We'll start with how do you reduce inflammation and in brain injury like this? Well, omega-3 fats are, are really uh, the key factor here. Uh, as you know, they play a very important structural role and part of the cell membrane. So those phospholipid structures with the glycerol backbone, they have those uh, fatty acids coming off the glycerol chain. And when you have more omega-3 fats, 
uh, you improve the cell membrane and the density, and you also it also has some signaling effects that help to even improve mitochondrial function. And remember that the eicosampantanoic acid can be cleaved off and converted into anti-inflammatory prostaglandin series three. And the more EPA and DHA you have esterifying the phospholipids, the less arachidonic acid is going to be there. And so with less arachidonic acid, you're gonna form less, and less inflammatory eicosanoids because there's less arachidonic acid to be converted into prostaglandin series two. So EPA and DHA are, uh, are highly enriched in neuronal uh, synaptosomal plasma membranes and vesicles. Nerve cells love omega-3 fats, as, and they love DHA to be a prominent part of the plasma membrane phospholipid structure. That's when they function best. Neuronal DHA in turn influences phospholipid content of the plasma membrane. DHA, as you'll see actually, when we talk about membrane repair, um, in the next video, you, you will see that adequate DHA is required along with citidine and, and choline to actually upregulate the synthesis of phosphatidylcholine and we think other uh, phospholipids as well like phosphatidylserine and phosphatidylethanolamine uh, production and it also promotes neurite outgrowth uh, during both development and adulthood. So DHA plays a, a, a significant role on many levels on preserving the nerve membrane structure, synthesis, and also uh, for growth and development of the nervous system. Animal models show that fish oil effectively reduces post-traumatic elevation. So when the brain gets injured, it reduces post-traumatic elevations in protein oxidation, resulting in stabilization of multiple molecular mediators of learning, memory, cellular energy homeostasis, and mitochondrial calcium homeostasis, as well as improving cognitive performance. DHA has also provided neuroprotection in experimental models of both focal and diffuse traumatic brain injury. Studies and other models of neurologic uh, injury have revealed a variety of potential mechanisms of neuroprotection in addition to DHA and EPA's well-established anti-inflammatory properties. So we know that EPA particularly reduces inflammation. And some studies have shown, these are animal studies now, that providing DHA prior to a brain injury reduces the extent of the injury to the brain when the trauma occurs. This has, we think, application for a lot of athletes who are playing different collision sports. But it probably has application for all of us, just in case you get into a, a motor vehicle accident or you know you fall off your bicycle or something. I, I think that we should all be cognizant of, of increasing our DHA intake and having that optimal at all times. So this takes us to a discussion about cur curcumin, because curcumin also has some important anti-inflammatory properties. These are only animal studies that we have so far. Um, curcumin is a highly lipophilic uh, molecule, so it's sort of fat soluble. It crosses the blood brain barrier. Not, not everything does, enabling it to exert its, its multitude of different established neuroprotective effects. So, an animal model showed that curcumin supplementation results in significant reduction of neuroinflammation via the inhibition of pro inflammatory molecules, interleukin 1b and nuclear factor kappa beta. So if you can suppress nuclear factor kappa beta, that stops the nuclear factor kappa beta from translocating to the nucleus and upregulating genes to produce a lot of inflammatory uh, cytokines. So that's an important finding, actually, that you can suppress interleukin 1b and nuclear factor kappa beta. And more importantly, the reduced neuroinflammatory response uh, mitigated post-traumatic reactive ast astrogliosis and prevented upregulation of water channel uh, aquaporin-4. This generally then all factored in reduces cellular edema. So some studies show the curcumin provided prophylactically, just like in the DHA studies, may, re may reduce uh, the extent of brain damage in traumatic brain injury models. So it seems like a very cruel thing to be doing to animals, to load them up with DHA or with curcumin and then give them a a tra some kind of trauma to the head and then see what happens. But that's how the studies are done. Animal studies demonstrate that curcumin is capable of significantly reducing post-traumatic elevations in lipid peroxidation 
and protein oxidation, as well as uh, disturbances in plasma membrane turnover and phospholipid metabolism. So it seems to have many stabilizing effects, not only as an anti-inflammatory, but um, uh, stopping uh, peroxidation as an antioxidant as well. Additionally, it has prevented reductions in proteins important for learning, memory, synaptic transmission, and promoted cellular energy homeostasis. Post-traumatic administration of curcumin, so after the fact, uh, it's also improved injury-associated behavioral impairment, thereby suggesting a curcumin-induced normalization of multiple molecular systems may help preserve neuronal structural and function during the post-injury period. So it's, it's a supplement to consider, although it's really only been used experimentally uh, to this point. The uh, next um, uh, supplement of consideration is a very important one. So if now you want to try to increase ATP production so you can get those pumps reestablished and pump out the ions that are being uh, over uh, influxed into the cell and, and bring back the ones that are in the extracellular space so they can uh, normalize the, the sodium-potassium balance and the, uh, the magnesium and potassium balance. Um, and so you need ATP to do that and also to generate energy to repair all the internal cellular damage that's occurred. This is where creatine plays a big role. So mild traumatic brain injury reduces brain creatine. So the injury itself reduces creatine probably because the creatine gets used up very quickly to try to generate ATP and fossil creatine levels in rodent models, suggesting that results in impairments in the maintenance of cellular energy may play a role in the evolution of secondary brain injury. So creatine is used to enhance ATP production. In the central nervous system, maintenance of cellular ATP levels is necessary for proper development and provides the cellular energy required to maintain the various cellular processes necessary for proper neuronal structure and function including the maintenance of neuronal membrane potential, ion gradients, underlying signal propagation and intracellular calcium homeostasis, neurotransmission, intracellular and intracellular signal transduction, and neuritic transport. More recent evidence also su suggests that creatine may serve as a neuronal co-transmitter augmenting postsynaptic GABA signal transduction. So studies of patients with CNS creatine deficiency. So when you look at patients that have a, a deficiency of creatine in the central nervous system, or when you produce uh, mouse models where you cause ablation of creatine kinase so they can't make creatine phosphate, it's demonstrated significant neurological impairment in the absence of proper creatine and phosphocreatine or creatine kinase function, thus highlighting its functional importance. So creatine is a necessary um, molecule for nerve cells and brain cells to have because it participates in all of these things that we're talking about, not just ATP energy, but signaling and ion gradients and uh, nerve transmission um, and neuri neuritic transport. And when the nerve cell becomes depleted of creatine, then it becomes very dysfunctional. And after a, br a brain injury like this, there is a significant drop-off in creatine and in phosphocreatine. And if you can get that creatine back in, some good things start to happen, as you will see. So preclinical studies in a variety of experimental models have suggested that dietary creatine may provide neuroprotection in animal models of chronic neurodegenerative disease, including Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, we've seen this, Huntington's disease, and may end amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. The neuroprotection effects may also be conferred in acute neurological injuries such as traumatic brain injury. So in rodents, pre-traumatic dietary supplementation with creatine, so you give them creatine first and then you know they have a, you give them a brain injury, uh, significantly reduce the magnitude of the cortical tissue damage and the concentration of two biomarkers of cellular injury free fatty acids and lactic acid following experimental injury. So we have some animal models to show that it can be very helpful. But you're going to see a, an amazing human study coming up. It was further elucidated that creatine-mediated neuroprotection is in part mediated by the maintenance of cellular ATP levels, so it helps to bring those ATP in, uh, uh, levels back up, and improvements in mitochondrial bioenergetics. So it helps the, the kick that mitochondria back into gear so it can function more effectively, produce its own energy, and, create, and also helping to repair the mitochondrial membrane potential, 
uh, and reductions in mitochondrial permeab permeability, so hydrogens are not leaking out of the mitochondria, forming free radicals, and you're decreasing reactive oxygen species and you're balancing calcium levels. In humans, studies uh, utilizing nuclear magnetic spectros spectroscopy have demonstrated that creatine supplementation it does indeed increase cerebral creatine and fossil creatine storage. So when you give humans more creatine in the form of creatine monohydrate, it crosses the blood-brain barrier, gets into the nerve cells, and it increases the, the, uh, the creatine phosphate in the brain. And several studies have suggested that creatine supplementation may also reduce oxidative DNA damage. So we're seeing creatine having even an antioxidant effect and helping to decrease glutamate uh, levels in Huntington disease patients. So it may work with the astrocyte to help clear um, the extra glutamate from the synaptic cleft. Another study highlighted that creatine supplementation marginally improved indices of mood and reduced the need for increased dopaminergic therapy in patients with Parkinson's disease. So we, we saw that in the Parkinson story where creatine, uh, a couple of preliminary studies have been helpful in Parkinson's management. Together, these data suggest that dietary creatine supplementation may effectively increase CNS creatine, fossil creatine stores, and may modulate human neurological diseases. So I think in almost any neurodegenerative diseases, creatine is something that should be applied, usually 5,000 milligrams twice a day or 5 grams twice a day. That's two teaspoons uh, a day mixed into some juice. Now here is the study of tremendous importance. This is a human pediatric study. So these are children who've had a brain injury. Preliminary results obtained in a pediatric population have suggested that post-traumatic oral creatine administration at a dose of 0 0.4 grams per kilogram of body weight given within four hours of traumatic brain injury and then daily thereafter may improve both acute and long-term outcomes. So in the acute phase, post-traumatic creatine administration seemed to reduce duration of the post-traumatic amnesia, length of time spent in the intensive care unit, and duration of intubation. At three and six months post-injury, subjects in the creatine treatment group, so they, they went on an ongoing basis, they kept taking uh, creatine, demonstrated improvement in indices of self-care, communication abilities, locomotion, sociability, personality or behavior and cognitive function when compared to untreated controls. Just remarkable. It's remarkable because this isn't being used across the board when people have concussions, including children. Further analysis of the same population revealed that patients in the creatine treatment group were less likely to experience headaches, dizziness, and fatigue over the six-month follow-up period. Creatine treatment appeared to be well tolerated and there were no significant side effects reported, which was consistent with other human studies utilizing higher doses. So the thing that's important to me is that omega-3 fats and curcumin and creatine monohydrate are not standard approaches that are used to reduce inflammation and help to regenerate nerve cell membranes and get ATP energy back and restore the mitochondrial damage and decrease glutamate damage. These things are not being used in traditional neurology and typical conventional care of concussion management. And these things really stand out. These are things that are being neglected that have tremendous potential to actually repair the damage on a cellular level that is in direct uh, uh, alignment with the actual injury that, that's occurred on, on the cellular level. So when we come back, we'll talk about what is also extremely important in repairing the nerve cell, and that is repairing the nerve cell membrane so things don't leak across and that you don't have too much glutamate escaping. You need to repair and rebuild that cell membrane as quickly as you can, both the outer membrane and also the mitochondrial membrane and the DNA uh, membrane as, as well. And so we'll look at how you do that most effectively. It's not about drugs. Uh, it's not about anything else. It's really about um, uh, what are the nutrients that you give this individual. That's how you repair it. So I'll be back shortly.